thank everyone who came yesterday for the church cleanup. If the church looks uh, cleaner, then uh, it's because of the people that showed up yesterday to clean. So thank you for everyone who came and who sacrificed their time. Um, part of the reason why we cleaned up yesterday is because um, lunch is actually starting up again soon downstairs. So they're opening the kitchen and uh, we'll have uh, lunch available downstairs. I believe it's next Sunday. Um, I'm getting some nods, so hopefully, yes. Uh, so hopefully that's something to look forward to uh, next Sunday as we get uh, home cooked, church cooked lunch. <laughs> Um, and we can share together. Um, so hopefully, um, hopefully your parents will stay around for that so that you can stay around for that. And uh, maybe we can grab a, grab a room either up, he up here or downstairs and uh, enjoy lunch together. So that would be great. And we haven't had lunch in here since before COVID hit. So it's been a long time in coming. All right, so let's turn now. We are, as I was going to say, we're finishing up Second Thessalonians. We, we're not finishing up Second Thessalonians. We are starting to finish up Second Thessalonians. Uh, so in your church Bible, it is page 837. 837. We are at the section labeled in the church Bible as final instructions. Now, of course, those, those section titles are just there. The NIV translators put them in just to help us to find our way around, help us to uh, you know, figure out what the passage is uh, quicker instead of having to read through the whole thing and summarize it. So it's just kind of for our convenience. But of course, those titles were not in the original Bible. So you know, those are inspired. The rest of the words are inspired, but the titles are not. All right, so let's read 2 Thessalonians, follow along with me, uh, 2 Thessalonians 5, and we're going to go from verse 12 all the way down to 15. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who work hard among you, who offer you in the Lord, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that no one pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Now, of course, this, these kind of closing remarks, Paul just kind of, as he's ending the, the letter, he just kind of gives like a rapid fire kind of last minute, like, things to do. <laughs> it's like this last checklist as he's, he's ending this letter, making sure he doesn't miss anything, make sure everything that he wants to say gets said before, you know, he finishes up the letter. Um, and it seems at first, you know, very kind of um, nice things that, you know, that our culture would say. Like, a lot of these things would would be the kind of things that you know my kids come home with school and they have like the be kind to everyone day and like all that kind of stuff um i think it was the with the ninth day of school they had like a big assembly and like they they handed out crown like paper crowns to everyone i don't know if they did that in the upper grades in your schools but in elementary school they did that um, probably in high school you guys weren't walking around with paper crowns um, that would be kind of silly, but, uh, and so we're like, what, what was so special about today? And like, my kids are like, it was a ninth day of school. I'm like, what's so special about the ninth day of school? Like, I didn't realize that was a, like a celebration day to, to do something special. Um, later on, like, uh, like my wife went to like a PTA meeting and all that stuff. And they're like, oh, it was cause it was like being kind to one another day or something like that. <laughs> Uh, and so these are like the values that, you know, even our schools try to teach us, you know, be kind and be nice to one another. Um, but as we've been looking through uh, First Thessalonians, 
even though some of the things might look similar, the foundation is as different as it could be. Because Paul's rooting all this in the fact that we are saved in Christ. The fact that we are sinful, yet God sent his son to die on the cross so that we can be his, and so we're his. And so therefore now we can do good deeds. Right? Not that our good deeds earn us salvation, but that we already have salvation, and now we can do these good deeds. Things. I want to preface well, uh, the passage this morning with that because that's the foundation and it's very important to understand that perspective. Because if we don't understand that perspective, then we come here and we look at this list of like commands and we're like, okay, this is, like, if we don't do this, then we're not going to be saved. And we're going to fall into some kind of legalism. We, we got to do these things because like, if we don't do these things, uh, you know, we're going to be totally, we're, we're not going to make it into heaven. Like, um, so there's a difference, like, right? If my kids do chores or if you do chores, you wash the dishes at home, say, whatever. You don't wash the dishes, or at least if your parents are any kind of, you know, nice, loving parents, you're washing dishes or vacuuming the floor or doing any of that, cleaning up your room because you are part of the family. Right? Guests don't need to vacuum the floor. Guests don't need to wash the dishes. You need to wash the floor and wash the dishes because you're family. You have that status. And so therefore, you know, cleaning up your room, cleaning the dishes, vacuuming the floor, all those chores do not earn you a place in the family. But they are things that family does. Whereas in what most people think Christianity is about is that you clean your room, and you do the dishes, and then that earns you a spot in the family. That's totally reversed, and it's a totally wrong way of thinking of it. So as we come into this, let's just keep that in mind. And I realize that I always, my worship always goes over time, and I always skip myself on time. And uh, my time's like half over already, and we haven't even gotten to the passage. But let's start, all right? So here... Paul is, last, the last thing he's going to do, he's going to talk about the worshiping community. And he's going to talk, talk to the church. What is now that the foundation of the church is so different from those people outside the church? Right? We've experienced the love of God in a way that no one else has. We've experienced salvation in a way that no one has because no one else has salvation other than through Christ and so how does now, how does our family life look? How does our church life look? How does our worship community look? Again, this does not make you part of the worship community. This is those that are already part of the community, already part of the family. How then should we act toward one another? Okay. So the first thing he talks about is how we relate to those who are over us. We could say our leaders, but interesting enough, he never labels these people, right? He just describes them in terms of what they do, okay? So what are these people? They are, verse 12, those who work hard among you, those who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. So this kind of person, he tells the church, you need to give your respect to. Not because of the position they hold, not because, you know, that's, that's often what parents usually say. Why should I do this? Because I'm your parent, right? Um, although Chinese parents, they sometimes do, because I feed you. And so I guess that would kind of be more in lines with First Thessalonians. Um, but give them respect, not because they have a title, not because they, you know, they, they come to Sunday more dressed up than you. But give them respect because of three things. Because they work hard among you. They work hard among you. And there are people in your midst and in our church that work very, very hard. Uh, over the English congregation, we have several ministry leaders. And now maybe would be a good time to introduce them because... Some of you newer junior highs have never met them before, and you're like, who in the world are these people? Uh, so ministry leaders, could you stand up? 
I guess I, I could have given you a little bit of uh, forewarning in case you're uh, suffering from, you know, last minute social anxiety. Um, but these are, these are your ministry leaders. These are people that help organize what goes on in the English uh, ministry. So Jose is our deacon in the back. Uh, Jay-Z is on the soundboard and Elliot is out front. And we, we help organize everything that's, and plan everything that's going on with the English ministries. Uh, and of course you have uh, Mary who helps out with the junior high and does a lot of extra work that uh, probably no one even knows about. And, and we have people helping out with downstairs, with children's ministry. There are so many people helping out. And Paul says, because these people are putting in such hard work, give them respect. Yeah, give them respect. This is kind of counter to what we grow up with in America. We, I don't know, we kind of have this, this cultural feeling that those that are in authority get dumped on and that, that earn our uh, complaining <laughs> and our derision. When, when we got a, I remember when we got a new New York City mayor, like one of the news stations was, like, was ta saying that you know, the whole purpose of a mayor is to be the central uh, figure so that we know where our complaints go. <laughs> that we can blame him for all the wrongs that happen in our city. Uh, that, that's how we treat authority in our culture in, in America, in New York City. But Paul says, in our worship community, in our church family, we need to respect those who are working hard because they're working hard. They're, they're, they're feeding into you. They're doing so much work so that you can grow spiritually, so that you can be led to God, that you understand the Bible, you understand uh, you how you, we build a Christian worldview, so, um, so, so you know who God is, you know who Jesus is, so you, you get to that place where you can make your own decision about accepting Jesus or not. That's, that's what us leaders do. And so we need to give those respect to those who work hard and who are over you in the Lord. That is, those who uh, care or have oversight over you. It's, yes, those leaders. But specifically, it says, in the Lord. That means in the same vein as if the Lord were among you. Kind of taking God, the Lord's place. Being, uh, in other parts of the Bible, it says, being a shepherd under the great shepherd. You know, some, we help lead you guys. Um, you know, hopefully, we, our goal is to lead you just as Christ would because we are accountable to Christ. And so we don't lead you in a way that's, you know, you know like we're megalomaniacs, like we're on a power trip. Um, you know, your leaders should lead you in a way that is in the Lord and then lastly, admonish you. Your leaders admonish you. If we see you doing something wrong, uh, we're going to speak up, not because you know, we're, uh, we're Christian Karens, but because uh, we're trying to correct you. We're trying to put you in the right path. We're trying to lead you in the way that uh, is, is good to grow in. And so that, those are the three uh, functions that Paul mentions of leaders. So he says, verse 13, Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Yeah, so these people that are, are investing into you, hold them in highest regard in love. Again, not because of their position, it says, but because of what they do. Now he says, it seems like this, the next phrase is totally random. Live in peace with each other. This is because when you do have loyalty and love and respect uh, for your leaders, in the world, it leads to division. Just look at our politics, right? Uh, every time you get a president, you get someone who doesn't like that president, and they, like, they make signs, not my president. It doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter what time it is, there's always some kind of contention Maybe, you know, recent years it feels like it's more contention than the past, but there's always been this kind of contention. There's always been this kind of disunity. 
that when the new person comes to power, uh, you know, you get the, the people who are really on board with that person and then people who maybe follow a different leader and they fight and they have disunity. Paul says, I think it's very telling, that after he says, respect and love your leaders, the next thing he says is be at peace with one another. That Christian community, our love for our leaders, our respect for our leaders, should lead to peace, unity, instead of division. And, and we know that this happened in the church, this division happened in the church, when you look at Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. Right? He's like, I heard that there's divisions among you. That some people follow this leader, and some people follow this church leader. And, and there's, there's contention. There's a lack of peace because there, people are different, following different leaders. You know, and, and Paul says, no, in the family of God, our respect and love for our leaders should lead to peace. So live at peace with each other. I'm sure he's saying that because he knows the danger or there's something already maybe, there's undercurrents of that happening at the Thessalonian church, and so he's addressing it. Verse 14, right now he's done with how we should treat our leaders. Now he says, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help those who are weak, be patient with everyone. Now, you notice there's no change in subject. There's no change in who Paul's talking to. He's not, you know, saying, church, general, you need to respect your leaders. Now, leaders, you got to take care of the idle. You got to encourage the timid. You got to, you know, lift up the weak. He doesn't say that. He's still talking to the same group of people. So as he's going on in verse uh, 14 and 15, he's still talking to the whole church, right? So even though, you know, the leaders do a lot of work, you, everyone else in the congregation, everyone else in the family of God also has work to do. And so he tells us how to treat those who are not leaders. And even stronger than that, I think there's a, a big division of people who pour into you and people who pull out of you. It's kind of easier to, to love those people who give you stuff, who is just easy to talk to, easy to get along with, you know, they're, they're serving you, they're doing stuff for you. It's easier to get along with them. How about those people in the church, in your families, who it's just draining to be around? Like, instead of you coming away from the relationship just energized and, like, you know, fed and, you know, all that stuff. Instead, it, it's, it's like you're the one who now has to do all the work. And, and if you're normal, you, you know who those kind of people are and you try to stay away from them. Because every single time you engage them in conversation or try to work with them or even try to help them out, you know, because, you know, you're, you're helpful and they have problems and you're trying to help them out. Every time you do that, it's so draining. Pastors know this the best because, like, anytime I get together with other other pastors, and, and we have pastor get-togethers, and most of the time we we spend swapping stories and like uh, sharing things that happen. Like, can you believe? Like, um, and, and most of these stories are about these needy kind of people, people who will call you up, pastor. Uh, I'm about to go to work. I I need safe travels as I go to work in the car or on the bus every morning. Or, Pastor, I'm on the toilet. Pray for a good poop. Uh, I even had a young man who would call me up at any time he was awake. Anytime he was having problems, he would call me. 
So this could be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It could also be at 2 o'clock in the morning. And, and, you know, this typical conversation at 2 in the morning would be like, Pastor Dan, I got in a huge fight with my parents six hours ago. And then I took a nap, and I woke up, and then I called you. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> um, it got to the point where he called me so much, I... I literally had like a Pavlovian response to the cell phone ring. Like you know that like ring the bell and the dog like salivates kind of thing? Like instead of that like my phone r ring and like I just get this fear. And, and so um, to this day actually I hate talking on the phone now because of that person. <laughs> I no longer enjoy talking on the phone. I, I have anxiety talking on the phone because of that person still. like. 10, 15 years later. But there are these kind of people in the church. And, and our response and our responsibility to them is not to run away because they're so draining, but to also love on them. Right? So it's easy to love on the people that are feeding into us, but how about those people that just drain us, that we don't want to talk to, that's just trouble every time we get involved with them. And guess what? Paul says, we urge you, brothers and sisters, all of us, myself included, warn those who are idle. Idle meaning uh, the Greek word Hannah has this sense of um, disobedience, insubordination. Like they know that what they should be doing and they just refuse to do it. And so not just someone who's just like, I don't want to get out of bed, like, not someone who's just sleepy, but someone who, who knows the right thing to do, and he just won't do it. Warn those people. Encourage the timid. The Greek literally says small of soul, like those people who, like, their life seems to be, like, any wind, just the, their, the candle of their life just flickers, and it's, like, in danger of going out. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. This is our responsibility for people in our midst that instead of feeding into us are very needy. And Paul says we have a responsibility to them. Verse 15, make sure that no one pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone. The, the Greek words are very much stronger than the NIV translates. I think they fixed it in the, the new NIV. Um, but it looks like from what you read in, in here, it says, you know, try to be kind. Like, it's like when I cook a new dish and my kids look at it, they're like, what's that? Like, I have that like, look on their face, like, ew. And you're like, just try it. Try it, and you might like it. Paul's not saying, don't return evil for evil, but just try it. Just try to do good. Like, you know, try it, you might like it. That's, that's not what Paul's saying. Uh, that, that word try to in, in the Greek is, is actually used of people who persecute the church. Right? So people who are persecuting, people who are trying to commit genocide or whatever the religious version of that is, um, they don't like go knocking, you know, say like World War II, the, the, the Nazis are trying to find the Jewish people. They didn't just try to find Jewish people. Hey, do you, do you happen to have any Jewish people here? No. Oh, okay. Let's go look somewhere else. No, they, they pursued them relentlessly. That's the word Paul's using here. So don't return evil for evil, but pursue the good in other people. Right? Chase after it. Seek it. So always try to see, always, he uses that word always, 
always, anytime, any place, anywhere. Make it your aim, make it your goal. Pursue, have that pursuit of kindness. Not what your schools teach you, like, just be kind to one another. Like, when you see each other, yeah, be kind. Instead of bullying one another, be kind. No, pursue the good of each other. Even when it hurts. Even when it feel, when you have to just pour into it and you're like, oh man, this is, this is so much hard work. Pursue being kind to one another, even with those people that drain you, even with those people that just use up all your energies and all your resources, still pursue being kind with them. And the reason why Paul can say this stuff, respect your leaders, love even those that are draining to you, is because our foundation in this community is God. The world can't tell you, pursue being kind, even when people drain you. The world says, be kind to people, but if it's too much trouble, just cut them off. Why? It's because, like, imagine you have a kindness tank. You've got a a love tank, and you pour into someone else. If you pour enough, you end up empty. I don't know if you've ever tried to love on someone that was hard. It feels, after a while, you're running on empty. And it's just not good for your mental health, not good for your, you know, your well-being to do that, to pour out and be empty. But Paul can say it because our foundation is God. Right? We don't just have our own love battery and, and, and when we plug into someone else that drains us, it drains our battery down and then we run empty. Paul can say that is because we've got, yes, our own love battery, but we are plugged into the source. It's like if you're using your phone and you're plugged into the wall, does your battery go down? No, it shouldn't. Okay, something's going wrong if you're... <laughs> Maybe your, your phone's being used too much. I don't know what, what processes your phone's going through there. To, you're, you're bit mining with your phone. <laughs> but if, if you're plugged into the outlet, your phone battery should not go down because you're constantly getting recharged from the, from the outlet. And so us too, in the family of God, we should be constantly recharged because we're connected with God. And so we can pour out to other people even if they drain us. Even if there, our battery is going down, we should never be empty as long as we're connected to the power source. And so that's the big difference between what Paul's saying and the ordinary just be kind that you're taught in school. This kind of kindness costs us. And this kind of kindness drains our batteries. But we have no fear of running empty as long as we're connected to God. We have no fear of loving other people because we are connected with the love of God. And the love of God knows no end. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as Paul has been teaching us, help us as a church community, as not just people who just show up at the same time, the same place, but, but people who are brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to have that kind of relationship that you desire from us. Help us to respect those that work hard in our midst. Help those who um, are over us and, and even correct us, even though maybe that correction doesn't feel so great at the time. Help us to love one another, even even those people that just are so draining. Those people that we have to pour into instead of people that pour into us. But Lord, we know that this is possible if we are connected to you. And Lord, we pray 
most importantly, Lord, that we would abide in you totally. So that when we love on others, we're, we're not loving in our own, out of our own resources. We're not loving out of our own ability to love. Because, God, you, you know our own ability to love is so small and, and so imperfect. Help us to love with your love that never runs out. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.